But this man is is an uncut gem. He is mm. he is a, he is a flawed. He's something that he's he is a flawed object. But there is value underneath you. You have to get past these flaws. Good evening, everyone. Please join me in welcoming Josh and Benny Safty. Yeah. Thank you wow. very much. Very, Thank you uh, for that. Wow. Amazing. Rapturous. That was nice. Appreciate that. <laughs> Brought my own water. There's a, nice, uh, <laughs> there's a nice echo. It almost feels like I'm not speaking into a microphone. It's just like, shh. That's the MoMA way, you know, we have an echo in here. We're such a cavernous, big theater. Titus. Titus. <laughs> Titus. Titus was uh, Alara's uh, bastard son, right? Whoa, wow. I mean, you just connected us <laughs> to you directly. What a perfect way to begin. He was born in the center of the, he was, Alara was caught, Zeus was caught sleeping with Alara. Hera was pissed, sent Alara to the center of the earth. She birthed Titus and uh, all these earthquakes and things. Happen. That is exactly how this theater came to be. <laughs> Please record that. We are here. The Safdies <laughs> just communicated that. So I'd like to, uh, first of all, I have to say, what a stunning film. Oh, what an incredible so ride you've taken us all on. This is absolutely <laughs> phenomenal work, through and through. Thank you. I'm getting emotional. I don't normally... <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I don't know. It's very... I'm getting emotional, not, no offense to you, I'm getting oh, emotional, whoever clapped really loudly over there. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. So I want to begin um, where you begin the film. 95% of this movie is set here in New York, just a few blocks away in the Diamond District. And yet, you begin the film in an Ethiopian Jewish mine two years earlier with this really horrific what? accident. Can you speak a little it's actually, bit? It's actually an Asian-operated, owned mine. That Amazing. the Jewish tribe work at. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about starting the movie there specifically? Uh, sure. The well, it's tricky because you know when we when ten years ago when we set out to start this project, we wrote the first draft ten years ago, one of 160 drafts, and it was wow. you know it, it, we did a couple of page one rewrites, maybe three or four. In the very very beginning. The th a couple things never changed. One, Howard's fate, he always met that fate. The fish. Uh, the, the, the fish? fish. The, the, the smuggling in the fish. The fish <laughs> smuggling, yes, that's another thing. Uh, uh, it uh, centered around a, the general plot, meta plot of, of, of this basketball player with this gemstone was kind of always there mm. in that shape. And, and it never was a diamond. And that, I can't say that came from anything but uh, just re research, uh, and not research in the Diamond District. The Diamond District is called the Diamond District. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I never was interested in the diamond, in, in the film revolving around a diamond. Mm. The clar I like colored stones. I, uh, I don't, the, the clarity of diamonds, the myth of it, you have to get into the whole De Beers myth and the PR stunting mm. and all that stuff. So I wasn't that interested in it. And when I started looking into colored stones, I stumbled on this thing called the sci-fi diamond, which is a black opal in particular, or opal mm -hmm. in general. And black opals in particular are, opals in general are unlucky. Black opals are actually lucky. And they erupt, there's all this energy talk, crystal stuff like that. But uh, I, I, so in that, when I stumbled upon that, and I, in <laughs> weird enough, this movie was contemporary always. Uh, it then eventually, at one point, it just became a, a period piece, 2012. Out of, <laughs> out of, out of necessity. Out of necessity, yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, but in 2012, there was a discovery in the mid-aughts. There was a discovery of a lot of black opals in Ethiopia. They were mostly confined to Australia. And uh, they started finding a bunch of them in, in Ethiopia. It's not like a diamond where you can kind of like generally judge and figure out through geological surveying, like, oh, there'll be some here. Mm -hmm. So they just started finding them, and, and uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I was fascinated. And then at, we watched the market on Ethiopian black opals just dis disintegrate and devolve because there was, they weren't, they didn't have like lasting power when you unearthed them. And, and coupled with, there was a basketball player originally attached to play this movie was Amari Stoudemire, who's a New York Nick. Wow. And uh, he's Jewish. 
and the beta, there's a huge contingency of beta Israelites in Ethiopia that I was reading about that, that Amari was kind of, he mentioned to me a few times about. So there was a lot of cross uh, pollination happening there, but, but it was, yeah, I mean, it, again, it was research and being fascinated with, and also the gem is called the, the gambler's gem. Yeah, yeah. Opals are considered gambler's well, gems. The difference, I, the main difference between diamonds and opals is there's, there is a weird inherent value to an opal that exists, whereas the diamonds, you can cut them in certain ways and kind of get around it. Mm -hmm. But also there's the, the fact that the problems that exist in Ethiopia are so, like, in, they're so intense. And then yet you always say, like, on the other side of the world, there's an equally intense problem for somebody else that has no bearing in the same way. There's some guy worried about his leg and dying. And then here's somebody worrying about a free throw. Oh yeah, the cosmic, the yeah. cosmic nature of it, the connectivity of, of, like yeah, Benny was saying, a worry in a microsecond about someone's life is. Yeah. And, also, it's just, it's and just then to, the other side is, just some, to see, is some jeweler worried about a basketball player and, hitting a free throw. And then it's but just, they're both yeah. life or death worries. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. just to see, like when they look at that stone, what they see, what Kevin looks at that stone and what he sees. And then when Howard looks at the stone and what he feels, you know, he doesn't necessarily see the same thing. There's a really cool photographer uh, from in mid-century photography named Gubelin, Ed Edward Gubelin, and he was the first person to do microphotography, getting inside gemstones and photographing wow. them. And then someone in a yard sale in LA, a guy named Danny Sanchez, found one of his books mm -hmm. and then said, oh, I want to do that too, and started photographing the interior of black opals and opals in general. And, and those were very inspiring for developing our journey through the gem, but but both of them were very interested in seeing the macro in the micro, uh, and, and you know, we can go on and on there. So that's, I think that's a perfect segue. Your journey through the gem, this comes up a few times in the film, and uh, you allow yourself to break sort of this frenetic, hyper-realistic world that you've constructed to go into something that is purely experiential, mm -hmm. to literally go into the stone and into the body at multiple times. Yeah. How did you decide where and how often it's appropriate to break that, to essentially you know, divide the cinematic construct? Well, it's, it's, it, that was a moment, like even the music, when the music plays is, is a specific thing, you know, the vibrations of the stone. When Howard first gets it, he feels it. And I remember when he is kind of really down and out in that back room, and he holds that stone. We talked about it a lot, back and forth. We went back and forth about, do we play the music? Do we not? Mm -hmm. Because in that moment, does Howard see himself? Is he self-reflexive? You know, because he is a gem himself. And yeah. when you go in at the end, you see that. But can he get at that in that moment? Is he capable? And it is, he isn't. You know, he's not capable. Well, in that yeah. moment, they're in just that, matter. Both of them yes. matter. Yes. And so you really hear the clinking of the, the ring on the stone. You hear, like, the, yeah. the thumbs, like, scraping against it. So that's what you feel, you feel that it's just a rock, you know, it's, it's such a, and so those moments are, of course, you know, they're thought of, because you have to understand who sees it and when they see it. One and of how the they harshest lines in the whole movie is yeah, Lakeith's the character, Damani says, he just offered you a quarter of a million dollars for a fucking rock, dummy. Yeah. And he says dummy in there, threw dummy in there. Dummy was earlier in the, in the script and Lakeith improvised that one dummy there. But there was just something about hearing one of the characters refer refer to something that means so much to you as just a rock. Mm. And uh, the other time that happens is Wayne at the end, and he's like, oh, no, "So it? yeah, so he missed a shot. Who cares?" Wayne is the high you know, the like, high roller yeah. dude who is like very tanned. Yeah. That was that's literally the entire basis of the movie is if he misses or makes a shot. And yeah, I love that. Like, I love that cares? line. Yeah, because it's all subjective uh, and, and relative. But 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 the. There's a new age quality to this movie. I know that mm -hmm. it has a frenetic pace uh, to it, but there's, you know, the, the inspiration of the score was new, originally new age music mm -hmm. and uh, the medicinal quality of music and, and uh, w what it means to, to kind of be uh, uh, agitated or erupted by music. And, and uh, the, the interior of the gemstone really was akin to, to that. It was uh, these meditations through stuff. You know, this movie's a materialist movie. It's about materialism, and, and uh, that, that's materialism away from consumerism. It's material, actual material. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know the, first, the, the first journey and the second journey are, are really uh, almost literal in the sense that they're just letting you know that this man is, is an uncut gem. He is, mm. 
he is a, he is a flawed. He's something that he's he is a flawed object, but there is value underneath you. You have to get past these flaws, and I think that um, you know what 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 what's what's interesting for for an audience point of view, and maybe you guys can disagree with me, because uh, I'm ultimately not the audience for this. I'm audience for my own titillation and things like that, but I'm not the audience for the movie. But it's you spend some people spend the, this movie. They spend the duration of the movie judging the character, mm -hmm. judging him, p passing judgment on him, and then eventually, you, he wins you over through his aspiration, through his uh, sheer drive and will, and and uh, his his upward striving, what what have you. He eventually wins you over, even if you don't really agree with it, mm -hmm. and then he's shot in the face. You know what yeah. I mean? And and you're forced in a weird way to judge your initial judgments, and you feel guilty for judging him because. They were superficial. I mean, the, the man is not a bad person. He might be doing bad things, but he's not a bad person, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So, and I want to pick up on something you said in there about the material uh, aspect of the film as well as the music. So, one no tricks point never, Dan Lo Patton did the music for this film. I know he was a frequent collaborator of Emeralds from Cleveland, ambient band, mm -hmm. has track titles like Dripping Water Hollows Out of Stone, Hyper Dawn, Sleep Dealer, incredibly... Uh, sleep Dealer is one of my favorites. Oh, Sleep Dealer, uh, incredible stuff. Uh, really, uh, no stranger to ephemeral. Yeah. No stranger to capturing this. How did he channel, specifically in the film, these emotions that people are feeling and convey those directly through? Was it a collaborative process from the beginning? Did it he, you very, know, like, sit back and score later? It was a very um, long process I, I we be good time we did worked on good time together as well mm -hmm. and that was a very quick process and, and you know and because we kind of we were kind of in a weird way on like making the score of good time was just like all right we got to do 600 miles in one night we just got to do it and you just you just drive and it's you also and very it was like literal to the emotions, yeah you're just you know, you're driving on a highway you just need to do 80 miles an hour and if Movie's someone's falling fast, asleep, someone that's fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was, but this was very different. This was, this was a, a, a bucolic, a, a scenic drive on a bu bu like strange bucolic landscape mm -hmm. at night though. So you're just like, so it was, it was tough. It was, uh, he had a hard time accessing. We, what we did is we spent weeks just going through all of his machines and wow. going through his libraries and just soloing the sounds that felt, that evoked certain feelings. Mm -hmm. Uh, stop me if this is boring, uh, and and uh, you know, and then once we had that, then he would. That's his. That's his fabric, and he'll make music using that. Moog made some patches specifically for us. They made like three or four. Wow, which was very cool. That was awesome, actually. That, but the, that they the did film that. is edited, and then we go like just as it's from a technical point of view, it's edited, and then we're watching the movie with Dan, and then figuring <laughs> out from that. So it's like it, yeah, he 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 did make music. Before the edit, uh, none of none of it was used, uh, and then and then he sent some stuff and it wasn't working. And the way we 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 edit is we edit we basically take a bunch of deep like dust you know dollar bin new age records and uh, and we layer them and we make our own scores out of them. Basically DJing the stuff and 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 making new pieces of music using these existing pieces of music, and then he has to in, listen to it, interpret it, and, and get at what it's doing, it's and do like something new, which is very be, difficult. He has to, it, we treat it almost like a video game. He has to beat wow. that to the point where it's like, once I start, stop asking to listen to the temp, you know, it's like when it's... Well, what, the the video game analogy is funny because when I went in and started working, when I realized we had to just do it together. Uh, he, he, you know, he would write, you know, we'd, we'd work and then he would write and then I was, and it was very nocturnal. We spent, t 12 weeks was how much, how long it took to do the score, but it was a lot. It was like overnight, every night, every single day. We had no days off and... Uh, so we were doing color and the sound mix yeah. at the same time. At the same time? Yeah, and then I, not the sound mix at yeah, the same time. The color that, wasn't happening at the same color, time as the and sound then it, mix. Then it switched over into the sound mix. Because then you were still yeah, working we're, on it. We weren't doing color and sound no, mix. No, I'm saying color time. and the sound mix while the score was while happening. While the score was happening. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the video game element of it, so there was this, there's this game, uh, there's this game Mega Man. And uh, we, um, you, Gradius, whatever. You have to, 
you have to you beat a certain boss, right? And you acquire some special tool mm -hmm. that serves that you don't understand what it could ever be used for. It's like bubbles, shooting bubbles. Like, when would I ever be able to kill someone using a bubble? We're not gamers, so I don't even like know why I'm making this analogy. But <laughs> but uh, but but it was but with Dan it was funny because certain cues would unlock this thing that we wouldn't know when its power would, or its success would come in handy. So we developing the schedule of how we would do each cue became so particular. And, uh, and I remember at one point he tried to jump ahead to a cue that I said we, we couldn't jump to. Yeah, we had to do seven, three, and ten first. He's like, no, no, I'm going to tackle one. And it was a nightmare because he did it and it was totally wrong. And, and then he came back and I said, you can't, you didn't have the right tool to beat that one yet. And uh, he apologized and we went, back, <laughs> we went back in order. But it was a very, it was very difficult because yes, we were looking at a lot of new age music and, and using sounds that are normally used for meditation, mm. like meditation bowls and, and, and uh, this thing called the space space, which is, this was designed by a woman named Constance Demby to erupt chakras. But we're using it in the context of, of you know, three guys getting locked into a vestibule. You know what I mean? So it, it, the juxtaposition <laughs> ends up being really, I think, really cool and and, and uh, uh, you know, provocative. And, and, this, and, and the point. sound, the sound design has also worked into the music as well. There's certain stunning. There's I have to say, the sound design in this film, and particularly the editing bringing all of these <laughs> tracks of dialogue on top of each other and having them all be intelligible is yeah, it was incredible. Well, well, Skip Livesay did our mix and he's, you know, he did he did amazing work on Gravity and Roma it was, and yeah, all it the was, Coen brothers. So we would obviously always look at him like, are we going too far? Is this far? He's like, was, no, 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 and he was, loved it. He loved and there was it. a moment where it's like, okay, we, we learned all about, because we, we actually, our Atmos mix is very this is an special. Atmos. I know it's not Atmos, but it's 7-1. And the way that Skip works is he likes to do Atmos first and then try and get the 7-1 to sound as much like the Atmos as possible, which is unbelievable. So this actually probably sounded almost as good as the Atmos. But there's just something about, once we learned, okay, where all the speakers are and what we can do with the dialogue, where we can place things, you're, now all of a sudden you're thinking about, okay, if the dialogue's over here, there's more room in these speakers for this music. And you're actually wo weaving it all together. And it's very, there's a, it's a, we spent... So, so much time in the mix, it was such a small time at first, and it just kept getting more and more because it got so intricate. But there's certain like honks of horns that when they were taken out, were missing from the soundtrack. And Josh was like, where is that? That's part of the song. Yeah, well, I would always <laughs> have Dan write the music you, listening to the sounds of the movie. So he's wow. playing with them. Because I think that, you know, particularly living in a city, uh, you know, your private noise is, 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 a, is part of a cacophony of noises, but it's very private to you. And that, and, but we wanted to try to, you know, at least sidle up alongside of what life feels like. Because there's, yeah, the, the fact that the, just that, that realism to get to that is so complicated. What actually goes into the noise on a street on like 50, 53rds, like with some of the streets we're I trying to recreate. I, they used Warren Shaw, who's our sound designer and editor, he was using these sound banks, and he was going and recording. I was like, I can tell that's not a Midtown Street. And he's like, There's like well, what do you mean? I was like, what street was that recorded on? And he <laughs> opens up the file, and he goes, yeah, this is 13th Street. I was like, <laughs> well, because I was it's like, like, I can tell. You, I, I can tell. You, <laughs> so like, then we go back with our mic. Yeah, we go, and go, we go and, we and record. record. You, you hear that, okay, there's not, there's not um, power tools being used on this construction because it's, it's in a biz, like there's a business in there. So you a lot of hammering of the scaffoldings going down. Here's a baby crying. You hear... Oh, we're close at by Howard's apartment. We're close to the FDR. We need to hear that whirring in the background at all times. So you're thinking there's a, about there's all. There's a great story about, from McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Uh, Altman, oh, I was at the premiere, the sitting next to Warren Beatty. Yeah. And uh, Warren Beatty turned to him 20 minutes into the movie, and he said, "Does the whole movie sound like this?" We actually, <laughs> we, actually we actually included a couple of those uh, buzzes in the movie. Yeah. Not about, yeah, the, text the phones, because yeah. it's like that happens, and you gotta well, keep it. So Warren Beatty turns to me and says. Does the whole movie sound like this? And and Altman turns him with a huge smile and goes, Yeah, isn't that awesome? And Warren Beatty's like, Oh fuck. I feel like this. Uh, but because because Altman was really pushing, he was really pushing yeah. the envelope, you know, and the player, it. what he did in the player is unbelievable. And and it's with still, the wired was, microphones. We even were like, we we were trying to get to that level on this, and it's still difficult. Well, what we did particularly, every scene that took place in his office and the showroom and the hallway elevator that was all on our stage in Long Island so we became really really 
you know, uh, to the production designer, we couldn't, we didn't move any of the, all the furniture became immovable. Mm -hmm. And our DP, Darius, is used to, you know, who's incredible, <laughs> but he, he's used to be able to move things around. You have a little hole. We have a cameras giant, in. This, we're on this giant stage, and yet we're stuck to this but, stage. But, like the, this but there's, I, I didn't, I didn't like, I don't like that idea. I don't like that luxury. If you can't move something, you, if you can't move it in real life, you wouldn't be able to move it for the movie. Wait, it, so it that helps. realism to the cinematography. It imposes it. It imposes it. And, uh, our production did make a mistake. We were supposed to have a little bit more room for a dolly, but he didn't. Uh, but, but, but when we went and started to do the sound design, you know, then Benny and I are going back to the Diamond District and recording all these, and we walked through this one space, and Benny kept the mic rolling by accident. It wasn't and, by accident. Oh, it, was, it wasn't yeah, by accident. It was so it was on purpose. Uh, I wanted to get his voice. The reason was I was trying to get his, the guy's voice through the wall as we were going through. But what we yeah. accidentally recorded was this high-pitched tone that alerts you that the front door is open. And, and when we were going through the, f the sounds, I was like, what is that high-pitched sound? And Warren's like, oh, 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 I was like, I know what, that's, that's to alert. So then when we drop that in, all of a sudden it's like, everything just all of a sudden clicks and feels alive and you can see, it's, it's great. We included, I remember when we sent Scott Rudin, who was, one of the, who was the producer who got involved three years ago, who really pushed us in an incredible way. Mm -hmm. When we sent him, I felt an obligation to send him our ADR pages, mm -hmm. and he, you know, he saw the script. He didn't well, think there was much sound work that yeah, was needed. ADR were not were, like normally. You you go to record somebody when you're looping to fix overlap. We had a lot of overlap in the film, and we tried to preserve it as much as possible. So we didn't. And need you it, can't. So and was, if you were to try an ADR, you'd have to get everybody in the room to ADR again. Which we just didn't. To make we it, we so. never wanted to to redo any of that stuff. So he was under the impression he was like. Well, how much looping could you possibly do? I, there's, I don't think I can't think of any moments in the movie that needed it. But he received a 45-page script. So he's like, "What <laughs> is this stuff?" Yeah. And I said, "Though this is the sound that's happening in the background." Wow. And uh, and he was just, I mean, he believed in us, which was incredible. Mm -hmm. Along the way, between 824 and Rudin and and Sandler and all of our crew members, that people believed in this. So they allowed us. They indulged. So we could bring people into a looping room and do, and do use them at the, our, the looping stage. They couldn't believe some of the people we were bringing in were off the street, and, and it was awesome. It was great. So that's I have to transition into I have so so many acting uh, performances in this film that I want to talk about, <laughs> and people who believe so much in the film they give such incredible performances. I just want to uh, highlight a few here: Idina Menzel as Dina. Absolutely stunning performance. With a single glance, she can burn right through the screen. <laughs> can, you, can you talk a little bit about the importance of her as well as Judd Hirsch, mm -hmm. and specifically the performance of family in this film? I know that family was a big influencing factor. I know that your father you know, worked in the Diamond District, yeah. and that was important. Can you talk a little bit about sort of these other sequences that come into play and which family are so important? So that the Seder with the Afikoman yeah. hiding the Afikoman. I mean, amazing I know, I'm surprised stuff. to see that the, uh, here the Afikoman's never been in a movie before. That's uh, crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was crazy. Well, what's crazy is, is if you don't know what the Afikoman is, it's like, what are these weird Jews doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what is in that pouch? What did he find? We didn't actually show the most important part of the Afikoman which is, finding, yeah, the which reward. is getting a little bit of <laughs> gelt, a, not gelt, but getting a little bit of money, some shekels, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, but, uh, but, but just the idea of like something being hidden and the, the tribalism of, the, of it was, is, was always dipping the, the red, the, you know, the, the, the drops of blood on the plate. But actually our, our, our dad, he read an early version of the script, and he loved the first version. I claim that he only loved it because it's the first thing he read in 25 years. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, because he's, he's a, our dad's a, 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 a smart person, but he's not, he doesn't, you know, he's not like a ferocious reader, uh, but he thinks a lot. But he, but then, so he's like, the first version was the best version. I was like, that it was the worst version. <laughs> uh, but he's like, but that gooey, why gooey? You gotta change the name gooey. And I was like, Gooey's a family member of ours. He's like, no one has a name like Gooey. I said, we went to Gooey's house all the time. And he was like, he just didn't want the Gooey reference at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, that, but yeah, the family stuff, you know, the, in particular, the tradition. I, mean, I think religion is so important because of its link to tradition and mm -hmm. its link to our past, especially in like such an ephemeral and time that we're living in. Just this idea of being linked to 
seven thousand years. Yeah, of and tradition. also and also with for Sam, years and for Sandler's character in particular, how fast he's moving for the rest of the movie and what he's kind of running away from. You need to see it. You need to see what it is that he has that he's maybe throwing away, and that gives his character so much more weight. And specifically with his family, you know, I th- remember talking with Sandler about it early on. And it was just a conversation of, like, he's got to check in with the daughter. What mm-hmm. is going on in his life, he's got to make sure that she still loves him. And just well, like, the, you the, know? in particular, what we were talking about is that the daughters of a certain age. Yes, who she totally. Knows. She knows what people, yeah. people know. People, are, people understand on a, on, a, on a subconscious level what's going on. Of course. And just the idea that Howard thinks that he can have a little pep talk <laughs> like, with yeah. her. And, and it'll, everything will be okay after yeah. that. You know, like, you love and, me, and right? Sandler <laughs> was, Sandler was very, he changed the line so, to I love you, to you love me. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was, his, Sandler was like, it's Howard's way of just being reminded that people actually do love him, that he's not going to get mm-hmm. punched in the face yeah. everywhere he goes. And, and, and that was, you know, then, that's particular, the whole, the suffering, learn through suffering is a very Jewish and then, thing, by the way. And then with, it, with, it, with Adina, it was actually important because we spoke with her just early on. She's like, I don't want this character to just be the classic, like, wife who's taken advantage of all, like, who goes to the, she's like, she I want She said, I don't want to play a bitch. Yeah, she, so, she said. <laughs> and that's so what she, she said. did. <laughs> and she said, I want to have an independence and a, and like, and we, we were like, that's exactly what we, we don't want this character to just be a throwaway, which we don't want any throwaway characters ever. And so... For her, to, she brought this kind of strength to that part, especially in Passover, that I love yeah. actually watching that with audiences because she's speaking for them in that moment. You know, it's like he's trying so hard, and you normally, a movie would be like, oh, let's root for Howard to get his life back together. But in that moment, you're on her side, and you're like, you know what, not going to work. Well, it's, her performance is beautiful. I mean, I remember mm-hmm. talking with her early on. It's so subtle up until that big scene, yeah. of course. Uh, you know, where she just has to convey things in looks. Uh, you know, you have the, you know, you have the the scene in the in the post school play uh, trunk scenario, the, tr- the trunk scenario. <laughs> uh, you know, where she just glances at her daughter. You know, because mm-hmm. they have an uh, understanding. Uh, she, you have the, you know, you have the look that she gives him earlier on when he when she just when she you just know that what she has to put up with mm-hmm. when she comes down. She's like, can you just go and put him to bed? And all he wants to do is wait for a time out. You know what I mean? And, and so she had, that was tough. And there was a scene that we cut out of the movie that was early on in the first act that she was in, that she was great great in it. She had all these subtle scenes and then she has this big scene opposite Sandler and and uh, the two of them had incredible uh, rapport. It really, they really did, the, it, was like a, it was like an understanding the way an old couple has an understanding. Well, you could feel a love existed at one point. You know, that's what makes it Absolutely. so important is that it isn't just hatred mm-hmm. and that's, yeah. And uh, and then J- Judd Hirsch. So I could say we met with oh him in God. 2011. Oh my A legend. That's incredible. My, my outgoing voicemail. I'll play it for you. <laughs> <laughs> See if I can. He goes, "Why did we meet back then?" We're like, ah, "We just wanted to meet." You know, <laughs> like, what was I going to do in the movie? We didn't know. Let's see. Uh, let's see if it lets me do it. Because there's no. Uh, there's no there's service there. down here. Uh, oh yeah, the that's thing that's he actually said to Titus. us. He said he right. That, that's before, probably good for movies, he, right? He said <laughs> he said um, he had just had like surgery on his back, and he's like, I'm not mm-hmm. going to be able to it's move like, as fast as you want me to move. And we're yeah. like, it's okay, it's okay. And then we did that scene where they're walking out onto out of the auction, and he was moving so fast, the dolly <laughs> couldn't keep up with him. You know, it was mm-hmm. unbelievable. He just <laughs> plugged into the, the the feeling of the movie and just ran. It was unbelievable. And it was just like that. And then he brings that energy on. I love that little scene uh, right outside on like 49th Street because it's just a, a strange side street in Midtown. That it's just so north. There's that Japanese food restaurant. And yeah. there's, there's a guy. There's a guy with bolt cutters that goes through. Because we always we keep it open because we want to keep wow. just the city through it all the time. Yeah, so that, those are and just that's New Yorkers. You, yeah, that's how, well, some of them are extras. Okay. And then occasionally you get a normal person who walks by, and a guy did walk through in the middle of a shot with bolt cutters in his hand. <laughs> it's like, and, and he just literally walks right in front of <laughs> of us of Judd and Sandler. The extras, like, <laughs> the extras casting people who are great on the film, they would ask me anything specific that you want, and I would throw things out there like that occasionally. But I could have never have thought of bolt cutters, because <laughs> like you know, and it's but it's great. And the guy walks by, he work, clearly works for the building or something. He's going to do some maintenance thing, but it's just a great moment because he doesn't look at the camera. He's yeah. looking at Bogosian saying, "See you, gooey." You know <laughs> what I mean? But but yeah, but Judd Judd was my my outgoing voicemail is Angela's theme from Taxi, and oh. I 
and I love, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I love, uh, we met with Judd about this movie in 2011. Wow. We didn't know what it was going to be for, because mm -hmm. there was no real character like that in the 2011. So he's like, what do you guys want, want from me? We're like, we don't know, we just love you. <laughs> and, uh, and he was so weirded out by it. And then, <laughs> and then later on, when we finally got him to be in the movie, it was, he's great. He adds a, um, he adds a, 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 like a link to the past in a cool way, mm -hmm. a, a, a tradition of Jewish actors, too, that, that's also special. He's very excited to curse when he gives them the opal. I yeah. remember that. Oh. He was very happy. Think if I can opal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. And I want to I wanna also make a connection. He's also, just so I can add, in Alex Rieger on Taxi, Mm -hmm. was always the voice of moral morality, always. Yes. As a kid, when I would watch that show, I was like, what, this is a weird adult show. Uh -huh. Didn't understand it, it was just like, <laughs> yeah. everything was moral and like, you know what I mean? And, and Alex Rieger was always, so strange. Yeah. yeah, and that song, I don't know, very melancholic show. I love Andy Kaufman too, so that was my in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I mean, that's, that's as good as it gets right there. And I, I do want to make a connection to it another... It gets better than Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I love Taxi. I mean, you know, opinions, opinions. Yes, yes. So, uh, But I want to make a connection to an older uh, Sidney Lumet movie. Um, obviously, you could make connections to Dog Day Afternoon, The Pawn Broker. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I really want to connect uh, to Prince of the City. Here for a minute. Yeah. Uh, a movie that I think this movie reminds me so much of and ambition and scope. Um, there's particularly a quote from Janet Maslin's original 1981 New York Times article about it that I feel like could directly represent Adam Sandler in this movie. I just want to read it to you real quick. Mr. Lamette's film offers such a sharply detailed landscape, such a rich and crowded portrait that his characters reveal themselves fully by the ways they move, eat, speak, listen, or lie. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how, Adam, how you got Adam Sandler to reveal himself for this movie, which I have to say is one of the most exceptional performances? Yeah, he's amazing in the film. I like that. It's, we know what's funny about Prince, Prince of the City is, is uh, PTA, mm -hmm. I think, set, told Sandler that he, he knew he was making this movie. I think he mentioned that film to Sandler. And Sandler asked me, "Do you know this movie?" I was like, "Of course, yeah." But uh, and he, I think he watched it. Um, but that's just a weird little detail. Uh, <laughs> the beauty of you know the connection, the Venn diagram of <laughs> Sandler and the people he's worked with. The other day, he told me that Danny Boyle tried to get him in a movie. He, all these, <laughs> all these people, he was going to do a movie with Park. I mean, he's just like the, thing is, the is directors he, who want to work well, with him he, are awesome. He has there's something that he has in all of his movies. Mm -hmm. You know, he can ground absurd situations in complete reality. Mm -hmm. You know, you watch his comedies. And you're rooting for him, even despite all the odds and despite all of the what's telling you in the film is not real. You're like, oh, that's got to have. He's got to do this. And so that quality, it's so strange to just be able to put somebody in a place and in a position and then believe it. And then in this case, it was like we knew we could use that because the movie doesn't work without Sandler. You There's know, a Sandler's Sandler's There's innate desire that you have for him. You want to root for him. Yeah. He's really bringing you along with him. On all these Only decisions. Sandler could have made this film. A lot of actors could have made the film work, but what I, function. He makes the movie function in the way mm -hmm. that Benny just outlined. He, we also had the benefit of following a 50-city tour that he did for his Netflix special, where he did three and a half hours of material every oh. night. And, and we saw a bunch of those performances. And he's reading the room. He's changing the script on the fly. And, and you know, our script, as you can imagine, had a lot of dialogue in it. He was afraid to play the character in the beginning. He was afraid for, you know, obvious reasons. He's a family man. This is a character he's never played before. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we, you know, he knew the tradition. You know, he knew that the, he knew, we mentioned Rodney Dangerfield early on with him. And mm -hmm. he knew that, that he had to be a jeweler. And he knew that our casting, we were going to put him up against real jewelers. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he had to... He had to do the work, and he did the work. He did. A, he spent a lot of time on his own in L.A. with jewelers. Then he came to New York. Uh, he spent a lot of time trailing one jeweler in particular named Todd Volpio, mm. who is uh, very much a Howard type. He's from Howard Beach, <laughs> uh, but he's <laughs> Where, uh, which is full. Of, it's just Howard. There's yeah, just Howard. Just Howard. <laughs> um, Howards of Howard and Beach. He, and 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 Todd is was very generous with his time, and we mm. would actually go and trail Todd together with Sandler. And Sandler would look across the room and, and let us know so little mannerisms that he wanted us to pick up on that we would write into the script later that night. Mm. Sandler's a crazy workaholic. I, I, that's something right. that I learned immediately. He's like, 
But it, it's it, nonstop. He doesn't sleep. I don't know where he gets all of his energy from. It's it's, not, it's, it's unbelievable. It's to like me. you're like, oh, what people are like, oh, was he Howard all the time? It's like, no, he was Howard all the time when we were rolling. And then when we weren't, he was just obsessed with trying to understand who Howard was, what he does, how he functions, just to be better the next time. We it did this thing, we did this thing with him four months before production where we we took we put him. We had him come to New York, and we told him it was under the. We told him we skewed the entire thing as a screen test for Julia Fox, mm. which it was. Mm -hmm. But it was also quietly also. Let's see what Howard sounds like, what he talks like, how he moves. Mm -hmm. uh, and Sandler probably knew that on some level. He's, but the we had this great filter of it's it's all about Julia. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and we did a handful of scenarios. We did one where we wrote a four-page scene. It's so easy to write. At, when you spend 10 years writing something, it's so easy to write Howard dialogue. It's so much fun. I miss it. You know, and that's the sad thing after 10 years is I don't have this guy to filter my life through anymore. Absolutely. Uh, but he, but he, we wrote this scene between him and Julia. Uh, it was a scene where it was the two of them and a salesman from Barney's. We had a dressing room, but we didn't have the whole, we barely had the dressing room to shoot in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's favor of a favor of a favor. Next thing you know, we're shooting in Barney's, but it's open. People walking by seeing, you know, Beta Howard, Proto Howard, and Julia having an argument about a dress and which one they want to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a great, it was a great scene. Uh, and then we went and we did a karaoke scenario where where it was Julia was with another jeweler and a couple prospective clients, and Howard shows up late because he couldn't get away from the family. Mm. And she immediately starts singing to him, and she picked the song. It was uh, Chris Isaac, um, uh, Wicked Games. Wicked Games. Uh, and then Sandler sang Doors Break On Through. It was an incredible performance. Howard singing that song. Wow. It was amazing. <laughs> and he did this little thing for the, the cowboy parts. <laughs> but he just, it was great. It was very, it was perfect. It was very Howard. Then we did this thing that was actually, those were all structured. Then we did this thing that was not structured, that as an actor I would find frightening where the next day we gathered a bunch of bookies real bookies that we were trying to convince to be in the movie and real athletes rappers uh degenerate gamblers people who went to jail for gambling mm -hmm. uh just just incredible grouping of people and then julia and a handful of her friends and we rented out a, a sports viewing room at 4040 club and we had two cameras and that was it and the game the script was there's a celtics game on your bet is your script, and that's it. The game is two and a half hours, so he was in there with two and a half hours with people wow. who want Adam Sandler, but he's in there in costume as Howard. So he's trying to give them enough Sandler so that he can get their characters to, in a weird way, sponge up. And, and that, when I saw him fall into that, uh, you know, I just knew that he was going to always have the spine of the character well, and always be able to build off of it and, and then it special and then the way we'd we'd shoot on like you just on this just use the stage as an example we would have like the cameras are usually far away with long lenses and we were moving so fast that Sandler would just kind of he's like I can't I don't know what lens they're shooting on so I don't know if this is my close-up or my wide shot I'm just gonna just have to be as if it's my close-up all the time and that's what it was for everybody and, but he, Sandler also, we didn't have playback, so he couldn't go and watch the performance. So there was this constant moving forward that he just totally embraced. Which is and, the character, yeah. too. Of course. Yeah. And I have to ask while we're here, uh, KG. Oh, yeah. Kevin Garnett. How did you get him on board? Was it, he gives such an incredible naturalistic performance. Yeah. It is so, so, it seems so fluid. Mm -hmm. Was he able to immediately embody that role? Did yeah. he need some guidance? Was it just? I mean, yeah, everything needs it, it, The guidance started the second year. Most of the time with any first timer, it's the, the first moment. Either you or the casting person stops them is when the direction begins. Mm. Because if you start on the wrong foot, it just sets the entire thing. Uh, uh, in a, uh, all down no, the they're not going to be comfortable with you. Yeah. you know, that's yeah. So our casting team usually are very sensitive and they know and they're but, but to be honest it's not like sensitive implies that it's a decision for them to be sensitive no that's in their intuition it's mm. just they love the people they're stopping and that love i think naturally induces a certain sort of confidence but um but but yeah K, kg you know he s has said this many times that he likens professional being a professional athlete to being an, uh, an actor he mm -hmm. thinks they're very similar uh he thinks that there's a 
the preparation that goes in. Uh, he called me coach at one point while we were on set. Whoa. Uh, and I said, did wow. you just, so did you call me coach? He says, yeah, you're the coach. That's the playbook. This is the, this is the game. Wow. And, uh, wow. And, and, but that was, he, and he was incredible at internalizing dialogue. Like, he felt a lot of pressure when he, you know, that big scene with him where he confronts Howard. Of course, which I love that scene. That is such a remarkable scene. Thank you. We spent the most time writing it. We spent the most time editing it. We spent the least time shooting it. It was, and it was, and we did like 18 takes with Kevin. It was Uh, a lot. The the edit of that was intense because it was, I remember Scott watching. He's like, oh, this is the best scene in the movie because we need to do the entire thing over again. I'm like, what do you mean? Because it could be the best. It's just not there yet. Well, he did say to me (laughs) when we were writing it, he was like, it seems to be the best scene in the movie. I was like, it's like, you know, no no easing in. It's like, he's just in these big mandates. This has to be the best scene yeah. in the movie. And you're just like, oh. So you sit and spend. And it's tough because you don't want to be preachy. You don't mm-hmm. want to be like, this is the meaning of but, the film. But, yeah. but you, but, and you want, to, you want to arrive at it naturally. Mm-hmm. And you know through Sandler's performance, you'll get that. And you know through the nuance of someone playing themselves, you'll get at something that will avoid... Um, not pretension, but but overt plotting or or, 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 or uh, condescending dialogue, where you're just a, a writer writing it and saying you speak these lines. Uh, the pawnbroker scene is is a is a great scene, but it's a, it's very much a written monologue. But it's mm-hmm. a great it's a great monologue. Yes. it's a different type of movie. Of uh, but it but it is a but it's still great because that's the scene that you think about, and that's we knew mm-hmm. that this had to be that scene well, and, and in Kev- some way. And Kevin in that scene in particular knew how to make the ideas his own, you know, the words that he would use and how he would say it. And we were open to that, you know, we were comfortable how he would make those kind of transitions. And then in that scene in particular, when we wanted to shake it up and switch up a little bit of the beginning of how he came in, became a little bit more angry, he was so comfortable. Like normally if you go in for a six page scene and you get something like a curveball thrown at you, it's gonna throw you off. He totally got it. I remember looking at Josh being like, this is unbelievable. He's so in it right now that we can just be this subtle. Yeah, on the, you you know? can give him micro notes yeah. and he could work them in. He was wow. very, he was, you know, he was, what he did was interesting. So Lakeith Stanfield, who's also unbelievable. Incredible. Yeah. Lakeith Stanfield, yeah. I want to just pause too and say Lakeith Stanfield gives in what would be any other film, like the dominating <laughs> performance of yeah. any but movie. It is astonishing. Very serious actor. Uh, you know, he was always... Uh, actually, the the Black Jew power mm-hmm. line, he improvised uh, because wow. he was reading. He's just finished playing, I think, playing Fred Hampton. Mm. Uh, oh my God! So he was reading about Black Panthers wow. in between, t- in between, <laughs> like in his trailer, yeah. and he brought that line, and it was such a smart. I mean, that's when you when you cast somebody, you cast intelligent people mm-hmm. so that they can bring things like that to a scene, and and wow. and I'm forever grateful to 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 our performers because they he did that. And he loves that line too, and he's happy that yeah. we used it because he was worried when he did it that he was going too far out on a limb. <laughs> but it's a great moment because he's shoving it back in Howard's face. It's like, you're gonna fetishize a black person being Jewish? Mm-hmm. How about I give you this? You know what I mean? So it's like, mm-hmm. it, it was a great moment. But but um, what Lakeith does as an actor, as a performer, uh, uh, Sandler said he saw Dustin Hoffman do it, uh, which was um, he creates a he makes up. Uh, a scenario, a scene that happens that precedes the action. And we don't say action or anything like that because we don't, and it's weird to say, like, it starts now. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And, and I also just feel self conscious saying that, that word. Uh, but I, he, he, like, supposedly, like Dustin Hoffman, he would improvise these scenes that happened before the action and he would get them going and he would do it every time when he was in the presence of KG. And KG is a very, very fast learner. Uh, it's how, why he was a very successful athlete. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he noticed that Lakeith was doing that, and and that it helped him, and that it was helping everybody. It was helping Kevin. Wow. It was helping everyone around him. So then, when Lakeith stopped being in scenes with Kevin, Kevin started to do that, and and I, when I heard Kevin and The Wire doing that, I turned to Ben. I was like, Kevin's doing what Lakeith is doing. He's like, I know this is insane. So you start, you develop a system, you develop a code, and then everyone kind of falls in line. And, and uh, you have all these parts firing on their own, and it's, it's you know, you can't ask for anything more. And it starts with Sandler, obviously. Sandler, yeah. it always well, started with Sandler. The, Bogosian yeah. said that all the time, because too. Eric was like, like, when he saw him doing his own stunt, getting whacked in the back. Yeah, he's, he's, like, oh, here yeah. I, he's like, here I am, I pull up, he, this is his first day on set, and he sees 
He's a, his whole thing was pull up in the car and then wrap back around and pull up in the car back, wrap around. Yeah. And the first time he pulls up, he sees the door fly open and Sandler running out in the loafers uh -huh. on wet grass and he's getting <laughs> tackled by these guys. Yeah. And they're not, there's like one stunt, act, stunt, stunt actor in that scene. Everybody else is just, they're wow. real people who haven't done that before and they're still chasing, grabbing him and roughing him up. And Eric's like, wow, this is, this is different. You know, this isn't what I'm used to. And, but yeah, Sandler being okay, like mm -hmm. this is how it's gonna be, to the point where when Eric got frustrated in those moments where he's like, I got lines, I got fucking lines to say, <laughs> screaming at everybody in the car, <laughs> he looks back and he sees Sandler literally with his shirt off and bruises <laughs> all over him, and he's like, oh yeah, this is, this is it, you know? And so he, wow. he adjusted, you know? And that's such an amazing scene as well. And I wanna particularly point out um, Darius Kanji's cinematography. Mm -hmm. I mean, throughout the film, incredible texture, incredible look of this film, but there's a specific moment when the car is pulling up in which the headlights of the car are reflected in Howard's glasses, <laughs> and he's like looking out and it synchronizes perfectly, perfectly with the Dan Lopatin score. How did, you, how did you get Darius to create this world that almost feels, it feels like a gemstone, like it feels like it mirrors the actual process of light being trapped. It's funny because we, uh, we had our constant reference on set was, um, you know, was, was, a, was an architect mm -hmm. named Michael Graves. Oh. And he, uh, Darius still to this day, the... yeah. MG he called it, he, Darius hated the reference, but he understood it. Michael Graves is a postmodern architect who, you know, some people aren't, if you're like, a romantic, you're certainly not a Michael, fan of Michael Graves. He's no, he's no Frank Lloyd Wright, you know what I mean? He's, yeah. he's, uh, he's, he made a lot of money and a huge career in develop, designing wheelchair stuff and, and mm -hmm. uh, hospital yeah, accoutrements. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it was, I, there was just I, I love Michael Graves, but Michael Graves, the, the postmodernist element of Michael Graves using something, uh, Understanding using something beauty, utilitarian yeah. as a decorative element mm. was, the general I idea. So in that in that jet in that showroom, Darius is known as the Prince of Darkness. That's like his nickname. Mm -hmm. And here we are making him expose <laughs> in the showroom where he's lighting, trying to figure you know, out yeah. the nuances between five, six, and eight, and twenty-two, and stuff like that. So and yeah, that's each, incredible. Each but light. in that but in that SUV scene, that was oh, huge that was for him because that he was in his element. Well, he also he had developed this system where the car has this giant grid on the top of it with lights on all sides. And he's just calling out colors as we're moving through wow. the as we're uh, we're moving through the scene. He's just like left blue, right red, back yellow, and he's just that's how he'll do it. And it's like they don't necessarily match up to reality, but it feels right. You know, that's remarkable. I know we have to wrap up. Uh, we're running sh out of time, but real quick, while I have you here, obviously I know that there were real life Diamond District jewelers on set. Uh, Todd, I believe as yeah. well. Uh, doesn't have to necessarily be Todd specifically but I'm wondering what is the best story that you have that you're allowed to share with us about something that these people did on set uh, or how, you know, like Howard learned from them. How, how did they influence one, the film One day directly? we showed up to set and uh, Todd, who was being paid as, the, as, the, outside, as yeah. the vibe ambassador, we show up in the showroom, which is a fictional showroom. Everything is surrounded by wood. You're in these big <laughs> lights. You're in a stage in Long Island. Mm -hmm. And everyone's waiting outside, looking upset. I'm like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, Todd's using the showroom. I said, Todd's using the showroom? What are you talking about? They go, he said he needed a few minutes in the showroom. <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, no, we got a long day. We got to go. Let's go. And I don't, I don't, I just barge in. And Todd is in there, and he has an, an, old, an older female client in, across the showroom from him. And he's showing her jewelry. <laughs> and, and I say to him, I said, Todd, what are you doing? He goes, oh my God, the biggest, the greatest director of all time. You don't understand, Joshua Safdie. This guy understands actors. He tells me I've got it. I don't know, do I got it? He's such a showman, you know what I mean? And he's saying, let me introduce you. you you're so, this is the next Steven Spielberg. He's telling this woman, please shake his hand. Tell her, isn't she gorgeous? Like, really, I was like part of the sale. And I see that she's, he has, she has this jewelry in front of him. And I'm just like, Todd, we got we to gotta shoot. And what, what's going on? He's like, oh, just a second, just a second. She lives in, she lives in Rosalind. I told her to come by. And, uh, and I, I said, is, he goes, is Adam here? Is Adam here? I was like, Adam's coming right now. He's like, oh, you're going to meet Adam, San Adam Sandler. He loves me. There's no one better than Adam Sandler, and he loves me. So I'll, I'll get you the autograph. I'll get you the picture. It was 
it was a whole was, thing. And then and she then, was just there. And then she was day. there for like half the <laughs> like day. She was sitting at watching. The thing is, we don't, we don't like, we won't be at the video village. We'll be on the set the whole day. And then at the end of the day, we walk by and she's sitting in like one of the chairs. She watching had the greatest. <laughs> and I found out she didn't buy anything off of Todd, but, oh, but, but she yeah. had a great, you know, but, but that energy was great. Just the fact that this yeah. guy, that if Howard was a vibe ambassador for a movie that they were doing, like oh, Stranger say. Among Us, maybe, he would make Sidney Lumet <laughs> wait a little he's bit. Like, yeah. He's like, he he's gonna be like, thing. this is, yeah. uh, hey, I'm doing something here, but this is my opportunity to show a little bit off, you know? And, like, <laughs> trust me, I, I love Todd, but I, you know how many times I've gotten the, just please come by for five minutes and just introduce <laughs> you to somebody. Next thing you know it, I'm taking a picture with somebody, I'm posing with jewelry, uh, <laughs> and I don't even know what for, but he's, He's, he's a special guy. I, I mean, there's, there was a lot of stories around Todd while we were shooting. One included involved the Celtics ring, but we, that's a story for another time. Okay. Yeah. Another time. We will certainly look forward to it. Josh and Benny Safdie, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Uncut Gems. Thank you. Amazing, amazing. And thanks for film. sticking around. Thank you for sticking around, yes. Thank you to MoMA. Yeah.